Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiator, and literally this is a response to Ziska Zenit, I hope I pronounced your username correctly, under my channel, so just published a video and, uh, I don't know, he or she, uh, Ziska Zenit said, can I do more videos on armour? The answer is yes, I can do more videos on armour. Yes, absolutely, Ian Lespina is your main go-to guy for things on medieval armour, at least, and uh, probably Raphael at Mestran for uh, classical period armour. But you know, I do know some things about armour, and uh, I have done armour videos. Uh, particularly, I would say my highlights are the ones at the Wallace Collection with um, Toby Capwell. But I've done videos about certain types of helmet, for example my uh, salé where I bash myself on the head with a rolling pin and my bassinet and various other bits of armour. But one thing, I looked around, I read this comment and I thought, yeah, you know, it's been a while since I did any videos on armour. Let's talk a little bit about mail. And this is a relatively simple point to make really, but something that I think, you know, I've got, what, 190-something thousand subscribers now, so there's quite a lot of which is crazy, but um, I'm not, uh, you know, I thank you for that, but that is uh, amazing, because I'm a fairly narrow um, uh, focus on, on this channel, so I'm quite amazed that I've got as many subs as I have, really. Um, but um, the fact is that I thought, yeah, I looked around my room and I thought, what have I got immediately to hand that I can divide armour? Mail! What can I say about that? Well, actually, so what is this? This is a mail standard. And why is it lying around in my room? Well, quite simply, because it's quite poorly shaped. And I was going to reshape it at some point, put it on new leather. It's, it's not very nice leather, but it's standard, mass-produced, but riveted, importantly. I would never buy butted mail. Come on. Um, riveted mail um, standard, or it is a standard. Well, so this is going to be somewhat tricky because I've got a microphone attached to me there, but I shall not talk for a second. It goes around there like that, okay? So it goes around your neck and it buckles at the back. And this type of mail standard was something that was worn quite a bit in the 15th century. Um, sometimes with... Uh, well, it was worn by all sorts of people, actually. So it was worn by fully armoured men-at-arms. Um, and um, in, as a neck protection uh, that was separate. Because obviously if you put... Um, if you've got a male shirt, for example, and you put a male shirt over your head, there has to be a big hope, um, opening, opening in the top of the male shirt so you can get it over your head, right? Um, so you stick the male shirt over here, but that means you've got nothing covering your neck. You couldn't have it tightly fitting around the neck unless you had some kind of lace-up arrangement, which would be a nuisance. So this is a nice, easy way to essentially plug that gap at the top of your male shirt and put around your neck. But they were worn independently um, by people with lesser degrees of armour as well. So someone who might wear a salé but doesn't want to wear a beva might wear that as neck protection. But they could be worn by fully armoured people who um, want something around the neck to protect their neck, obviously, from things coming underneath. But additionally, I have found... Um, with my breastplate, um, which fits pretty well, um, and it was was made to me, but there are certain ways you can fall, which are, which can be a bit perilous towards the front of your your neck um, from your own armour. And in fact, having something around your neck there, obviously you will have a collar of an arming doublet, uh, but with this over the top as well, just gives you a bit of extra security there. That it can go over or under a breastplate, um, and as I mentioned, can be worn by all sorts of different people um, with different levels of armour. But that's not actually what I wanted to talk about, although it is quite an interesting thing in its own right, and notice quite a particular shape um, that seems to work. Um, although, as I said, I would like to replace the leather on this because the leather is crap. Um, it's crap Indian leather. Might be. Yeah, I think it's probably Indian leather. And it's just not very nice. But the mail is pretty good. Now, riveted mail. What I really wanted to talk about, um, and, and there's not an awful lot to say about this really, but I'll try. <laughs> um, there are um, many sizes of ring. Now, that might seem like an incredibly simple fact, but maybe not that many people out there are aware of that. So that's why I mentioned the number of subs. So I often make the assumption that 90% of people watching my channel know lots of stuff about weapons and armour, but just by process of elimination and, and likelihood, it's, it's very probable that a, a large number of people watching my videos don't actually know some relatively basic things. So um, I thought I should mention, in case you didn't know, that mail comes in lots of different sizes, but not simply different sizes across the um, like a piece. So you don't just get, I will get a mail shirt with 
eight millimeter rings or I will get a male shirt with six millimeter rings. More than that, traditional male, when you actually go to a museum or uh, any other kind of collection where you can actually see original bits of riveted um, male armor from Europe or anywhere else, could be um, Indo-Persian or even Japanese, you will find that male often varies in size throughout a single piece, okay? So if you look at a, a male hauberk from the 15th, 14th, 15th century that still survives, there's, I can think of a sort of 16th century example anyway in the Wallace collection, and you look at the rings, the rings actually vary in size throughout the hauberk, throughout the shirt. Um, so you might find that it has particularly small rings around the neck because you don't want to get at all pierced by anything around there and equally in some bits of the the neck where it's standing upright it can be stiffer so what you do there's a, like with so many things in life there's a trade-off when you make the rings smaller you increase the level of protection because the holes get smaller but equally the overlaps become bigger essentially so you're you're essentially making something that's more robust with smaller gaps but unfortunately the downside is it becomes stiffer so if you make the rings smaller assuming they're riveted and still of a certain thickness they're going to become stiffer there are there is a caveat I have to add to that so there is a certain type of indo-persian butted male it's not riveted butted male where the rings are tiny absolutely tiny and that can still be very flexible, but the rings individually are very thin. Um, so that's how they get around that. They use very, very thin wire to make these butted rings. Um, but generally speaking, if you make smaller rings and they're still closely together and still riveted, um, then it becomes stiffer. So for example, if you have a, a band of mail going around your neck, um, it can practically stand upright and there might be a tiny bit of flex to it you can move around like this but it's not as soft and pliable as this type of male is because the holes are smaller but on other areas of your body for example I don't know around your midriff for example you could have larger rings um, so really just to say and it's really just to say that that not only do we find a relatively large diversity of the size of rings across male, aka chain male armour, across periods and across geography, but equally you find um, a, quite a big variation of the size of rings within an individual piece. Um, finally, I would just say there are certain tenses, I've mentioned Indo-Persian male, so Indo-Persian male, at least the high status stuff, tends to be very, very little rings, but it is butted. They couldn't make rings that small riveted. In Europe, the rings are, individ I would say on average, individually more robust, um, but they're riveted um, as well. Um, but the rings are a bit bigger, okay? So it's a slightly different way of doing things. In Japan, you get male, which is a greater number of rings linked into one. I think it's six in one usually in Japan, although they might have four in one as well. In most of the rest of the world, it's four in one. Japan often like to do things differently to everyone else. Um, and um, North African uh, male is often quite similar to European male. It can be riveted, it can be butted. Um, but generally speaking, European male, oh, an ancient era male. So if we look at Roman male, my understanding is the tendency is they tended to use slightly lighter but smaller rings in Roman, um, Roman lorica. Um, whereas um, in medieval male, they tend to use slightly heavier gauge, slightly larger rings. But as said, there is a lot of variation. And an individual piece, like something that goes around your neck, could be made of really quite small rings in medieval or Renaissance Europe. And also, finally to say, male has had one of the longest periods of use of any type of armour, because not only was it used by the Romans, you know, it was used in the ancient world, um, and supposedly they got the technology from the Celts, not a term that I'm particularly fond of, but there we go. Um, supposedly the Romans took that technology from the Celts. And a little fact as well, a lot of you, when you think of a Roman soldier, think of Lorica Segmentata, they actually wore male for a longer period than they wore that plated armor okay um, but male armor was used in the ancient world and it was used all over the world of course as we've just talked about but it was used all the way through obviously the medieval period it was actually used in the what we would call the renaissance um, so let's say you know 15th 16th 17th centuries as well um, 
it more or less went out of use in most parts of Western Europe, but was still used in Eastern Europe and still obviously used in Asia right the way through um, the through to the um, 19th century, certainly in India and some areas. Um, and what people often forget is it was used to some degree as well uh, by Europeans. In the 19th century, it was used as uh, for some cavalrymen. So if you look at British uh, hussars, many of them have um, male epaulettes. And these, this was something that was uh, learned in India. It was quite good to protect from the cuts of tulwars um, for no real weight or or heat um, problems. You could add these um, male things. And people who were um, in the horse artillery often had mail sewn down the outside of their leg um, on their uniform to protect their legs while they were sitting on the gun, for, again, from Tolwa cuts. So that was used. But equally in World War One, it saw a comeback and you actually see certain types of tank driver in World War One with that. Basically, they've got these goggles. You've probably seen the things, these sort of ventilated metal goggles that look a bit like uh, Mencia, Fecht and Schlager um, goggles, visor type thing, with this hanging down to protect from flying bits of shrapnel. Obviously, it's not going to protect from a bullet, um, but it will hopefully offer some protection to um, flying bits of wood and stuff like that, shrapnel from explosions and splinters and stuff. Um, and it is a fantastic defence, and people often talk about overcoming mail. Yes, you can overcome it with a good thrust from a spear or half sorting or whatever, but really the benefits of mail are flexibility and it doesn't really make you any hotter, apart from the fact you're carrying a bit more, well, quite a bit more weight. It lets heat transfer through plate armour and uh, padded armour are horrible for heat. Mail is fantastic. So there we go, a little um, sort of ode to, uh, to, to the fantastic nature of mail or chain mail armour. Um, and remember, it came in lots of different sizes, folks. <laughs> Cheers for watching, and I'll see you guys for the next video. Cheers. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe. We've got extra videos on Patreon, t-shirts on Spreadshirt, and I hope to see you for the next video.